Happy Palm Sunday, everybody. Uh, how many of you grew up in, in church, and when you were a kid, Palm Sunday was the day you got to whack your friends with a palm branch, right? That's what we looked forward to. Every, they would pass them out, uh, and uh, you, I just, the, all I cared about was I wanted the longest one, so I had the most reach, so I could, I could swap people like five people down. Um, I don't think that's what we're supposed to do, but when you're seven, uh, that's what you do. And so uh, welcome to, to Palm Sunday. No palm branches needed today. Uh, we're trying to help you behave while you're here. So, um, so Palm Sunday, what Palm Sunday means is that next Sunday is Easter. And how do we feel about Easter here at Cicero Christian Church? Yeah, baby. We're pretty excited about Easter. At least I am, and I'm hoping that just overflows onto you. I'm trying to, I'm trying to make it something contagious, but um, it is my absolute favorite Sunday of the year, and I just can't wait to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus with you next Sunday. And so you guys are going to do some things to help us out, right? You're going to invite your friends, family, coworkers, because Easter is the time when people who don't normally attend church are more likely to attend church, right? And so you're, you're going to invite people. I'm going to preach the gospel. God's going to change lives. You remember that? So your job is invite. My job is and God is going to absolutely. It's going to be awesome. So I can't wait. So you're going to come hopefully at 9 or, or noon to help us out and make, make room for more people. If you show up at 1030, we're not going to stop. We're going to be like, no, nope, you were here last week at 1030. You can't come in. So, but like we're, it's the spirit of the law, right? So um, I, just can't, I can't wait. It's going to be awesome. But before Easter can come, there has to be something else, right? There, there can be no resurrection unless there is a crucifixion. And so today, that's, that's kind of where we're going to go. We're going to talk about that today. I, I want to share a, a, a goal that I've had for about 20, 25 years now, and I still haven't accomplished it, so <laughs> it tells you a little bit about me. But I have always wanted to be able to play the hammer dulcimer. You guys know what that is? It's like a, a board with strings on it, like guitar strings or piano strings, and you hit them with these tongs they call hammers. And uh, it can be just the most beautiful instrument. I was inspired to, to want to do this by one of my favorite Christian music artists of the 80s and 90s, a guy named Rich Mullins. Anybody remember Rich Mullins? Our God is an awesome God. That was him. Uh, and so I thought, man, if I could play the hammer dulcimer, I would just be sitting on cloud nine. And um, because it sounds so beautiful when it's played well, when it's played poorly, it sounds like a piano rolling down a hill with cats inside of it. I mean, just that's, so it can sound really terrible if you don't know what you're doing, but it can also sound amazing. And so I never really pursued that. I, I would watch people play online, and I would shop for hammer dulcimers and found out they're, they're kind of expensive, so I never bought one. But uh, a couple years ago, somebody found one in the attic here at the church and that knew that I liked this instrument and brought it to me and said, hey, I found this upstairs, so now you can learn to play. And I was like, yes, because it also it came with a, a DVD, How to Play the Hammer Dulcimer. I was like, this is, this, my dream is coming true. It's not going to be long before I'm going to be making YouTube videos. I'm going to be uh, YouTube famous for playing this amazing instrument. So I watched a couple, right, I watched a couple <laughs> uh, of these uh, lessons and um, tried to do what the lesson said and found out really quickly, this is way harder than I thought. Um, either it's just really, really hard instrument to play, or I'm not nearly as musically talented as I would like to think of myself as being. So probably both. <laughs> and I just thought, man, this is so hard. I don't think I can do this. I, I don't think I can do this. And so all of my dreams and, and visions of learning to play this beautiful instrument just kind of got set in the corner, uh, literally collecting dust, because it just was so hard. And I, you've probably had similar experiences. There's something that you wanted to learn how to do or a new skill you wanted to pick up. Maybe you wanted to learn a musical instrument at one point, or maybe you wanted to learn a new language and you thought, hey, they've got this Duolingo app. I'll just download that. I'll learn Chinese. And in a month, I'll be speaking Mandarin. It's going to be awesome. Anybody ever tried that? It's way harder than you think. It's just, it's just not that easy. And so what we do when we bump up some, against something that that, that's too hard. We either look for an easier way. There's got to be an easier. If there's an app, shouldn't that be easy? There, there's got to be an easier way. Or our, our, our goal just kind of gets shoved in a corner and we forget about it and we move on. That's just life, right? But the problem is, I think sometimes we approach our faith in a similar way. 
When you first came to Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've given your life to Christ, when you first did that, you're probably pretty excited about it. And you thought, I, this is great. I, I can't wait to spend the rest of my life serving God, following Jesus. And then you came up against some things, some, some, some expectations of a follower of Jesus that, that were just really hard. Maybe you had to walk away from some things in your past, or maybe you had to give up uh, some, something comfortable or convenient so that you could pursue God's way, and, and you came up against these, and you just thought, oh, this is, this is way harder than I thought. I wonder if there's an easier, I wonder if there's an easier way. And maybe you found an easier way. Maybe you found what you thought was an, an easier way to, to, to follow Jesus, and it, and it just kind of involved, there's a few basic things I can do. I can show up at church uh, as, as often as I can, a couple times a month, or I can, um, you know, I can, I can try to pray maybe sometimes, you know, uh, lead my family in a, a prayer or for dinner, um, and, and maybe there's just an easier way. I, I can do these basic things, and I don't have to do the hard things, and I still kind of get the, the reward or the benefit that I'm looking for. What, what if there's not an easier way? What if there's actually only one way to follow Jesus, and that way is the hard way? Are you still in? That, that's the question Jesus' disciples had to wrestle with when uh, Palm Sunday comes around, and this whole week that leads up to Easter, they had to wrestle with this question uh, over and over again. It, it starts before that in Matthew chapter 16. Uh, Jesus is about to tell the disciples what's going to happen. This is what's coming for me. So if you have a Bible, uh, grab that, uh, follow along on the screen. You can follow along in your app. We have sermon notes in the app if you have the Cicero Fam app. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer. He's going to suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. Fear not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He lays it out there for them. This is coming. This is down the road. He actually does this three separate times. He says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and when I get there, they're going to arrest me. It's going to be terrible. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die the most humiliating death. A person can die. And then... I'm going to come out of that grave. And he told them this over and over and over again. And when Peter hears this for the first time, his reaction is very strong. Can you imagine how confident you would have to be in your position to rebuke Jesus? <laughs> uh, so, sorry, Lord and Savior, Son of God, but uh, I, I think you, we need to have a little sidebar here. Um, these words that you're saying, you're, you're going to bum the other guys out, you know? They, they think that they're following a king that's going to conquer, and you're going you're gonna to elevate them to positions of authority, and, 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 and you're, you're changing the plot on them. Like, you've, you need to cut this out. You know, they're going to they're gonna walk away if they think that, that they're suffering in pain. And besides, Jesus, that's not the way this is supposed to go. That's not the story. That's not how the story goes. The Messiah is going to come and conquer our enemies for us. The Messiah is, is not going to suffer. He's not going to be humiliated. Because if, if my king suffers, what does that say is down the road for me? If my king gets humiliated, what, what, what's in store for me? And he, he rebelled against this idea that, that his Lord and Savior was going to suffer and die. So he pulls Jesus aside and he says, you gotta, you got you to get back on the same page with the rest of us here. And Jesus, it says he turned, and then he said to Peter. And I think we, we, we hear that he turned. Yeah, obviously, well, he turned to Peter to look at him. He was already looking at Peter. Peter had pulled him aside. They were having this sidebar conversation face-to-face. -face. I think when it says he turned, I think he turned away from Peter. He turned away from Peter and said, you get behind me, Satan. You're acting like the enemy. You're trying to lead me away from my calling and my purpose. You better get in line. You better get in line behind me. And by the way, Here's what it means to follow me. If anyone would come after me, he too is going to take up a cross, just like me. That's what it means to follow. And, 
I don't know if the disciples really got this. I just know that, that when Palm Sunday came around, it was the most exciting day. Jesus comes into town and they, they throw a parade for him and people are saying, this is, this is the one who comes in the name of the Lord and they want, they want Jesus to be their king. And, and the disciples are looking at each other going, here we go, this is it, it's finally happening. This is the moment we've been waiting for when Jesus is gonna conquer Rome and, and we don't know how it's gonna happen, but he's gonna win and we're gonna be victorious. And just a few days later, the crowd is screaming for his death. Jesus picked up a cross and he told us to pick up a cross because there wasn't another way. In Luke chapter 22, we get this really intimate scene where Jesus is praying in the garden. If, you, if you've seen the movie, The Passion of the Christ, this is my favorite, least favorite scene. You know how, how you kind of have those where it just draws you in, but at the same time, it breaks your heart. Luke chapter 22, verse 39, it says, he, he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. This is right after the, the Lord's Supper, the first time when Jesus takes the Passover and changes it into something that was no longer about Israel, but is about him. He says, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. Then they go out to the garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. Verse 40, when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. This is, this is a hinge pin moment in history. This is, this is a turning point for you and for me and for the whole world. Because Jesus is at a place where he realizes he has options. From this moment on, it's, there's no turning back, but he, he, he goes to his Father. He knows what's ahead. He knows the suffering and pain, the humiliation, the wrath of God being forsaken by his Father. He knows all of that is down the road, right around the corner. Starts tomorrow. And so he goes to his Father and he says, I know you love me, Dad. Is there another way? Is there an easier way? If you are willing, remove this cup from me. And what is the answer that he gets from his father who loves him? I'm not willing. There is no other way. We're going to celebrate like crazy next Sunday because of the resurrection, but there can be no resurrection without the cross. There's no other way. We've got to go down this path of pain and suffering and humiliation there's no other way. This is what love requires. This is what love requires. That's why there's no other way. See, Jesus is making a connection with his life between the first and second greatest commandments of God's word. The first commandment, Jesus says, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And the second is linked to it. It's like it. it. It makes the first one possible, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And the cross then becomes the intersection between the first commandment and the second. Jesus goes to the cross out of obedience and love for his heavenly Father. And going to the cross is an act of sacrificial love for you and me. Jesus demonstrates his love for the Father by going to the cross for us, thereby fusing the first and second commandment inseparably and saying, if you love God, you're going to follow me down a path that may lead you into pain and suffering, at least into inconvenience and giving up your comfort. At least that, maybe more. Because that's what love requires. You've got to set your preferences, your, your conveniences, your comfort aside. Not because the people around you deserve it, but because God loved you so much that he sent his son to redeem you from death and bring you into life. 
And if you love him back, you show it by sacrificing for other people. That's the message of the cross. It's the culmination of all of Jesus' teaching up to this moment where he had come and said, I'm going I'm to invite you into a different kind of kingdom. A kingdom that's upside down where, where the first shall be last and the last shall be first, where if you want to be great, you become the servant of all. And he put an exclamation point on that teaching by going to the cross for you and me. This is not the actions of a king. In fact, this was the Jews' biggest problem with Jesus, is that he claimed to be the king of Israel, and yet here he is hanging on a cross. In John chapter 19, we get this little kind of side note. It says, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. That's the accusation that the Jews brought before Pilate. They said, this man is claiming to be king. That's an act of rebellion against Rome, isn't it? I mean, you guys should be more mad about this than we are. He's claiming to be a king. And so he's crucified. And Pilate puts that above his head. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic and Latin and in Greek. He wanted to make sure everybody got the message. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. They were so, they were so worked up about this idea of Jesus being known as the king of the Jews because for them, they, that's not our king. Our king doesn't go to a cross. Our king doesn't suffer and die. That's not the kind of king God promised. That's not the kind of king that we imagine. That's not the kind of king we're looking for. This, this can't be our king. Please don't call him that. And yet he was the very king God had promised and they just missed it. And I wonder sometimes if we've, if we've got into this, this world of, of showing up at church and, and trying to do the right things, trying to be good and not bad, uh, be, because we think that's going to lead to some, some kind of blissful existence where nothing bad ever happens to us and God you know, just pours out on us everything that we want. Jesus gives a very different message. He says, if you want to follow me, yes, there's good. Yes, there's victory. Yes, there's a resurrection down the road. But first, there's going to be pain. Not pain for pain's sake, but pain for the sake of demonstrating our love for God by sacrificially loving others. Sometimes doing what love requires is costly. We spend a lot of effort and energy protecting ourselves from things that are going to hurt us even from things that might inconvenience us, we have learned to avoid certain people because they're going to ask me to do something. They're going to ask for some of my time and, and I don't want to have to say no to their face so I just kind of won't be around them. We protect ourselves, put helmets on our kids, even though we survived somehow doing far worse than they will ever do without a helmet. That's not a bad thing, parents. You can put helmets on your kids. It's fine. Just let them play in the street then. <laughs> joking, I'm joking. Jesus says, maybe, maybe the path to what you're looking for, the path to peace and joy and purpose, the path to eternal life and the relationship with God that, that drew you in once and called to you once and caused you to give your life away once, maybe that life is going to require some pain and suffering, some inconvenience, Maybe it's going to require you to pick up your cross. We, we've used this term, maybe you've used the term, this is my cross to bear, right? Maybe, maybe we're not using that exactly right. Not all pain and suffering in your life is a cross. Sometimes your pain and suffering is your fault. You did something stupid, and now you're paying the consequences. That's not your cross to bear. Sometimes your pain and suffering is just a result of living in a fallen world. Bad things happen. Because there are bad people and there's evil in the world. That's probably not your cross to bear. Your cross to bear is not your mother-in-law. It's not your colicky baby or your disrespectful teenager. The cross is something you pick up on purpose. No one forces it on you. But you choose a life of sacrificial love, not because the people around you are so great and they deserve it, but because God is so great. And he deserves your love. And the way you show love for God, Jesus said and then did, is to sacrifice for others. Sometimes doing what love requires. 
is costly. And sometimes we need to be reminded that it's possible, right? So going back to my hammer dulcimer dream, um, whenever I uh, stumble across a YouTube video of Rich Mullins playing the hammer dulcimer, my, my passion gets reignited because I'm reminded it's possible. And I want you to share my dream. So I want to show you this video. Uh, who wishes they could do that? Would, wouldn't that be awesome? Man, every time I watch that, I'm like, it's, it's worth it. It's probably worth it. Whatever it would cost me to get to be able to do that, I would do it. I mean, it just, that, that reminder that it's possible and it's absolutely worth it, we need that. And so I think God puts people uh, in our world to remind us this is possible. And I think of my friend Mark Fisher, whose brother was very ill. Mark wasn't ill. Mark was fine, but his brother needed a kidney. And so Mark risked his own health and donated his own kidney for his brother because sometimes doing what love requires is costly. And, and Mark's act of love was not just for his brother, but it was an act of love and confidence in God. And we need those reminders. It's possible to put my own comfort and my own health and my own Convenience aside, for the sake of another human being, it's possible, and it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. We have foster parents in our church family who looked at some children that needed a loving home and said, I don't have time for this. I don't know how to do this, but I am willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to complicate my life. I'm willing to sacrifice all of my free time, my energy, my sanity to provide a loving home for these children. Because sometimes doing what love requires is costly. And it's a great testimony to us. It's possible. It's possible to actually live this way, to live in such a way that we say, what I want is not the most important thing. But I love God so much that if, if the path to showing him my love is that I sacrifice for others, I'll do it. It's worth it. I read this story just yesterday uh, that I, I want to share with you, and it uh, really... I'm still kind of processing it. So uh, it was a missionary named Ken Ripken. He was writing a story about uh, his time in Mogadishu. This is actually very recent, so it was kind of just, just happened. He, he was serving with a Christian organization in Mogadishu, but he was invited to attend kind of a, uh, a secretive meeting of pastors uh, from northern Africa and the Middle East. And so these pastors are coming together. These are, are people who are focused specifically on showing God's love to Muslims in a way that might move them towards Jesus. And in this uh, sort of secretive meeting of, of these guys that are really on the front lines, uh, this man stands up, Pastor H from Iran. Pastor H begins to tell everybody about what God is doing through his ministry and how many doors God is opening for, in the Muslim world for him to share about Jesus and how many Muslims are actually beginning to, to move towards Jesus because of the gospel. And he's so excited about this, he talked for two hours. And, and at some point, some of the other people in the room started to get nervous because the things he's saying are very dangerous for him to say out loud. And they're trying to get him to be quiet, but he wouldn't. He went for two hours, uh, and then they, they moved on. And this, uh, uh, Ken Ripken went back to Mogadishu and, and st just stayed in touch with these men. He was praying for them, and, and um, he got word a couple weeks later that Pastor H had uh, disappeared. He was gone. Nobody knew where he was. Um, they did some digging. They found out that there was someone in their secret meeting uh, who was pretending to be a Christian so he could kind of uh, get some things to hold against these people. And he, he told some people in Iran about Pastor H, and they took him. A couple weeks after that, uh, there is a service happening uh, in a church uh, in the area where Pastor H ministered. And many people, a couple dozen people, have showed up at this church to be baptized because of 
the testimony of Pastor H and his willingness to share the gospel with them. And while uh, they're, they're getting ready to do the baptism and the first man is, is in the baptistry with the, the pastor of this church, the, the pastor gets a phone call. His wife brings him his cell phone and says, you need to take this. And it's somebody on the other line telling him that Pastor H was found dead. So he turns to this man and he says, the, the man who loved you enough to risk his life to share the gospel with you is dead. This is the cost of following Jesus. Are you ready to be baptized? My guess is that's not how your baptism went. If, you're, if you've given your life to Christ and been baptized into, into Jesus, my guess is that's not what it looked like. But what if it had? Along with the promises of victory over sin, of conquering death and, and receiving eternal life and, and having access to the Holy Spirit and peace and joy and purpose, along with that, did anybody tell you that you're also going to have to carry a cross. And so he looks at this man and says, the, the man who loved you enough to give his life so that he could share the gospel with you is dead. Are you ready to be baptized? And he said, yes, I'm ready. And every other person who had showed up to be baptized that day said, yes. Can you imagine what God can do in that community with people who look death in the face, they see what the cost is, they know what it means to pick up a cross, and they do it Anyway, can you imagine what kind of impact God can have through people like that? Or through people like us who recognize that, that yes, there, there's victory at the end. Yes, there, there's peace and joy and purpose. Yes, there's the Holy Spirit that gives me direct access to the power of God the Father. But the pathway to that is going to lead me through some pain and suffering. I'm going to be asked to sacrifice my convenience, my comfort, sometimes things that are really important to me for the sake of someone else knowing who Jesus is and experiencing the love of God. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? That, that's the decision that you wake up with every morning, whether you know it or not. Is it worth it to follow Jesus today? Is it worth it? If it costs me reputation, is it worth it? If, if it costs me some time today that I haven't scheduled to spend with another human, it, if it costs me some time, is it worth it? it? If it costs me some money today to follow Jesus and show love to other people, is it worth it? That's the decision we wake up with every day. And what God can do through people who say yes every single day is absolutely changed the world because that's what he did through these disciples who said yes and picked up their cross. He changed the world through them and he is still changing the world through people who say yes every single day. If, it, if it's gonna cost you, are you still willing to follow? And those are the kind of people that God uses to bring uh, health to people who need a kidney, to bring a loving home to children who need it. Those are the kind of people that God is using. Don't you want to be one? Sometimes doing what love requires is costly. Is it worth it? It's a question only you can answer. I'm convinced that it is. And I want you to be convinced too. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for this difficult message, but one that has to come before next Sunday, before we can celebrate the resurrection, God. We have to understand the crucifixion. My prayer is, Father, that you would put it on our hearts to understand that, that what Jesus did for us, he did out of love for you, out of obedience to you, because you decided we were worth it. And God, may we, may we receive that love and may we, we turn it back around and show you our love by loving the people around us, even when it's costly. And may you be honored by that and may, be pe may people brought to Jesus by that. That's my prayer. Would you use the people in this room who are willing to say yes to Jesus every day to bring life and peace and hope, forgiveness and grace and eternal life to people in our community? Would you use us, Father? In Christ's name we pray, amen.